Today, we will do something different from our usual sermon style. Uh, we will do Q&A. Q or questions that a lot of you kept asking since George Floyd's death and how should a Christian respond? And the A are answers from a biblical perspective, not political. Now, to give the context why we are doing this Q&A, especially those who are watching from outside the United States, last May 25, 2020, or three weeks ago, George Floyd died in the hands of police officers. And perceived by many as unjust and racially motivated, his death ignited protests in more than 400 cities across America and around the world. Now, some of the demonstrations were peaceful, while others involved the burning of properties, looting, and more killing. Now, that's the context. Now, here are some questions. Let me start with this one. What is racism, and what does the Bible say about racism? Now, Oxford Dictionary defines racism as the discrimination directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. So in our context here in the United States, if my skin color is black or dark or brown, a racist person will view and treat me in a less respectful way, based solely on the color of my skin. Is that right? Is that wrong? That leads us to the next question. The second part of that, what does the Bible say about racism? The short answer is, the Bible denounces all forms of racial discrimination. That's also the position of Mosaic Church and my personal position as well. Now, where can we find that in the Bible? Let me give you both the Old and New Testament basis. The first is the Old Testament. Genesis 1, 26 to 27 states that every individual bears God's image. Every individual bears God's image. It says, Then God said, when he created humans, Let us make men or humans in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, what does this mean? Now, let me use an analogy from Thailand. Now, there's a law in Thailand called Les Majeste, a French term which means to do wrong to majesty, where if you make fun or you insult any image of the royal family, such as their statues, photos, posters, even the photo of the king in their currency, you will lend seven to 13 years in jail. Why? Because you are not just disrespecting a piece of paper. You are also disrespecting the actual person behind that image because the image is an extension of that person. In the same way, you are also disrespecting God when you disrespect another human being with different skin color because God's image is in that person. That's what the verse means when it says that human beings are created in God's image. Now here in America, 
the closest analogy would be burning the flag or burning the U.S. Embassy. Our flag or our embassy images or represents the USA. So when someone burns our flag or our embassy, we feel angry because he is not just burning a piece of cloth or a piece of building, but also insulting what the flag or the embassy represents. In the same way, just as a flag or an embassy uh, represents us, whether it's a new flag or a discolored flag, whether it's a new embassy or a rundown embassy, every person represents God regardless of his color. And you don't look down or treat another human being as second class because he bears God's image. That is why Mosaic Church denounces all forms of racial discrimination in the strongest possible terms. And Mosaic Church affirms that every human being, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, nationality, or socioeconomic status, is to be treated with dignity. In short, George Floyd should have been treated with dignity, respect, and fairness, even if he's proven to be a criminal. Regardless of the color of his skin, he bore the image of God. But that is also true with the policemen in this case. They bore the image of God and they must be treated with dignity, respect, and fairness. That is not a political statement. That's a biblical statement. Now in the New Testament, Christ eliminated all racial and social discriminations for Christians. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. In short, the differences in race, rank, and sex are still there, but they are no longer barriers in the way we treat each other. We now recognize each other as equals, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, other verses you might want to meditate are uh, Colossians 3.11 and Acts 10.34. There in those passages, they say that God doesn't show partiality. These are just a few of the many verses and why we denounce racism. Next question. Can you provide biblical passages that tell us we are from the same root regardless of color and race? Now I can cite a couple of verses. First is Genesis chapter 3 verse 20. It says, The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. That last part, she was the mother of all living or humans, means that every human being descended from Eve. Regardless of your color, we all descended from the same parents, Adam and Eve. And the truth that all types of people, whether you are red, yellow, black, or white, came from this one couple is reiterated in the New Testament. Acts 17, 26 says, And he made from one man, one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Did you notice that? He made from one He made from one man every nation of mankind. So both the Old and New Testament recognize that we are all from the same root, regardless of color and race. Uh, The next question says, 
How does God view different skin colors? Oh, he views them as beauty. And he calls it very good. Genesis 1, 31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now, what did God create on the sixth day that he called very good? Now, aside from land animals, he created our first parents, Adam and Eve. And our first parents had in their reproductive DNA all kinds of skin colors. And God calls it very good. Now, all his other creations, he called them just good. But when he created our first parents, he calls it very good. You see, the different skin color is part of God's creativity and definition of beauty. So, to relegate a particular skin color as inferior is insulting in God's intelligence. In fact, in the future, you will see in heaven different skin colors, different kinds of people. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the land, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. <laughs> what are they doing? Worshiping God and enjoying God because they are all God's children. In short, <laughs> just like that song, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in His sight. By the way, there were two false teachings in the past that people used to justify the enslavement of Africans. Number one, the so-called Mark of Cain mentioned in Genesis 4.12. And number two, the curse of Ham mentioned in Genesis 9.25. They erroneously said that these refer to being black. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Guys, there are no exegetical bases for those interpretations. <laughs> Just Google Mark of Cain and Curse of Ham to know more about it. I won't even discuss it here since it's so wrong. This next question is a uh, combination of two questions. On the one hand, it, if racism and justice are important, why not release a statement immediately, like three weeks ago? The other camp also asked, <laughs> why release a statement that will be politicized? In short, the fifth question is this, why did I or we, why did we not release a statement immediately? And the second part, why release a statement at all? <laughs> Valid questions. Now, this video serves as our statement, but there are three reasons why we waited a bit to release a statement. Because to do so is like pouring gasoline on a fire. First, emotions are high right now, especially in the previous two weeks. And if you are not rational because emotions took over, you rush saying and doing things that you will regret later on. And I have seen friends and pastor friends posting things on Facebook that they now keep re-explaining or wished they have not posted them in the first place. Proverbs 19.2 says, Desire without knowledge is not good. In other words, Desire to say or to do something without complete knowledge is not good. And whoever makes haste with his feet to say or to do something misses his way. 
When emotions with incomplete knowledge take over, more mistakes will be committed. Now take for example this photo here. Secondly, there's a lot of disinformation going around right now. Not just misinformation, but disinformation propaganda. For instance, I've seen videos where a group deliberately cut portions from the whole video footage to mislead viewers about the rival group. Or an opposing group only shows the extreme of the other group and present it as normative. Again, don't be sucked in with what you immediately see in your newsfeed. To do that is to pour more gasoline on a fire. The third, but number one factor, is the reality of spiritual forces behind everything that's happening. Satan's desire since the beginning is to divide and destroy. Do you think it's as simple as blacks versus whites? Or Republicans versus Democrats? Or us versus them? Wake up, my friend. Behind the scene is a spiritual, invisible battle. And you can only win spiritual battles with spiritual weapons. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, or just the visible, but against the rulers, against the authorities. Now, rulers and authorities here refer to spiritual, invisible, demonic forces. Against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, this passage then went on to tell us the spiritual armor that we need to wear to win the spiritual battle going on behind the scene. And at the end of that passage, it tells us to be praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplications. When George Floyd happened three weeks ago, I started praying for his family. I started praying for the black community, the police force. I hope you were on your knees a long time before you posted something on Facebook. The sixth question. What can you say about the looting and destroying of properties since this is the way they can be heard? I understand the frustration and anger, but injustice does not solve injustice. Both Martin Luther King Jr. and the family of George Floyd advocated against non-peaceful demonstrations. Yes, every individual deserves justice. And God will see to it that that will happen. It may not be here on earth, but in God's book, justice will ultimately be served against those who did not serve justice. Jeremiah 22, 3 says, Thus says the Lord, Do justice and righteousness, and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. Now, Notice how God gives special mention to some groups. And do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless, and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. Now, why is there a special mention of these groups? Because they don't have money or connections to fight for themselves. That's why God commanded the leaders not to ignore them. Because it's so easy to ignore them under unfortunate circumstances. No wonder justice, as represented by Lady Justice, has often been depicted wearing a blindfold. Now, the blindfold means that those who render justice should not be swayed by someone's wealth, power, or social status. Justice should be impartial. But 
if you show preferential treatment because the color of his skin represents the so-called superior race or because he is wealthy and then you ignored the flight of the poor or the inferior race, <laughs> then watch out. Because Proverbs 14, 31 says, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker. But he who is generous to the needy honors him. God will see to it that what you saw, you reap. Last question. How do we as Christians take action during situations like this? Four suggestions. Let's start with the simplest. First, search your own heart. Always start with this one. Whenever you have quiet time, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, do I have racist or discriminatory thoughts, words, and actions? Reveal them to me, Lord, so that I will repent from them. Now, God's word is blunt, straightforward. But if you show partiality, such as racism, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. That's from James chapter 2, verse 9. Second, start at home. Start at home. Jennifer Richardson from Yale University said, unless parents actively teach kids not to be racists, they will be. In short, parents, teach your kids. Better still, Filipino kids, teach your parents. Anyways, talk about it when you're eating dinner. Invite non-Filipinos into your house. Now third, join Christian groups that advocate for them. Tomorrow I am participating in an organization called United We Stand. Now this organization specifically addresses racism and discrimination against uh, minorities. Now, this was started by Houston Christian leaders, both blacks and whites and other colors. If you want to join, leave me a message on FB or text me, and I will give you more information. Fourth, and the most important to me, plant gospel-centered churches. Now, let me explain. Only the gospel can truly transform people's hearts. Without the transforming power of the gospel, there won't be any genuine change, regardless of how many laws we made. Now, Dr. Jim Dennison uh, accurately states, the gospel of God's reconciling love is the only transforming answer to the challenges we face. Legislation and the civil rights movement were essential to improving the lives of those who faced legalized discrimination. But, he said, laws cannot change people. Only the Spirit can do that. And as a result, Christians <laughs> like us are on the front lines of this spiritual battle for the soul and future of our nation. That's why I love church planting because only when people receive the gospel can there be real change. I cannot overemphasize this truth. I pray uh, this short Q&A gave you some clarity and direction on how to respond during these troubled times. And don't lose hope. We have a God who is sovereign in control, and who hears the cries of the unheard. Press on, my brothers and sisters.